Welcome to No Instructions number 10. We're in the double digits. I'm Bob. And I'm Josh. And we're in the double digits. Woo! Woohoo! And... Two whole hands. Two... Yeah. Well, not two whole hands. I guess it is two whole hands. I don't know why okay? that seemed weird for me. It is two whole hands. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, like, that's 12. It's not cartoon hands. That's weird. <laughs> Anyway, I don't know. Was it me? It was a twelve fingered man. A twelve fingered. It <laughs> wasn't me. Yeah. So we're working on uh, book. Not not book. Well, it is book two. Lion two. The blue lion. Both starting on the blue lion. Yep. Today of the Voltron Lego set. Um, anybody that's watching the video, you may notice that I also made the little close up cameras a little bit bigger. And it's funny because they're almost as big as, like the well, the angle's different. But it kind of looks weird because you can see my torso and then it's like a cutoff and then oh, yeah. the rest of my torso. And also notice this. This is really cool. Watch. So if I, if I make my hand go across, it goes out of one camera into the other oh. and it's really big. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. See, we, uh, see I'm going off to... Yep. Oh, man. It's weird. You should watch the YouTube video. It's just silliness. Yep. Damn. Well... Oh, welcome back. Welcome back. We got back Saturday. Today's Monday. Got back Saturday mm-hmm. from California. This episode theoretically would have been done last week and released tomorrow. Yeah. That's probably not happening. Oh no, 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 no. We were in California working on a project with Matter Hackers. How was your trip? What did you think about the trip as a whole? Uh, I think it went really well. So the the project manage kind of designer part of me and talking to them. Uh, our original, are we talking about the original product idea? Yeah, yeah, it'll okay. be out before then. So originally we talked to Rhonda and Alec at Matter Hackers about making um, a big skee ball table. That's kind of the uh, the sequel to the foosball table that you made. Mm-hmm. Kids upstairs, sorry. Bang, bang, bang. Bang, 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 bang. But like making a Foosball table is surprisingly difficult. Because uh, not a foosball table. A not a foosball table. A skee ball table. Skee ball table. Sorry. Skee ball table. Just because is it of a like, table? Do you call that a table? I don't know what you call it. Skee ball. Skee ball run. Skee ball. Alley. Alley. Board. Game. Kind of, yeah. Skee ball game. There you go. Okay. Because you really do have to make. Well, you don't really have to make two, but they would come in pairs so that you could kind of go against somebody. Mm. But there's not a lot of like official dimensions that you could either scale up or scale down for size. Like the ping pong table that we made that we're using right now. Like there's an official table tennis league of the world. It should be this height by this width by this, whatever. Um, that doesn't exist for ski ball. So the ramp that we could find, I would almost guarantee it's out there somewhere. I looked on the dark web. I, um, <laughs> I looked at a lot of places and I mean, people have made them, Yeah, but it's just, it's inconsistent as to like the ramp dimensions and we weren't sure how big the space was going to be that they were going to need. So my theory on that is that it's not a, it it is a single player game. It's not a competitive game. So there's not a standard because you're really only playing against your past self. Whereas ping pong, Mm -hmm. you want two people to be able to practice on the same situation separately and come together and and compete. I looked at it like the, the side by side kind of basketball arcade games. I mean, you can play side by side with someone, right. but you don't have to. True, but even building one, I mean, building one's hard enough. Building two is just twice as many of the same pieces. Yeah, no, I'm just talking about why there's not a standard. And I think it's it's not a sport. Yeah. I mean, even that is a really, really weird topic about what is considered a sport versus a hobby versus a, like artistic form. Hmm. But, I mean, there could be leagues. I, I don't know of any leagues. But there's not a lot of standardization in the ski ball world. And it was a really busy time around here, so we didn't the have a lot, of, world. Yeah, a lot of communication back and forth. And so as a, managing that project, it got kind of nerve-wracking because it was like two weeks before we were supposed to go. And we're like, are you sure you want a ski ball table? Like, how big does it need to be? And we're like, oh, we're not really sure. So we kind of scrapped it. Um, and we went with a perfection game. So we talked about making like a big game and we went back and forth on a bunch of different ideas. 
the little claw thing that grabs. Don't give them all away because we might do some in the future. Okay, well, I already said the one. Well, the shady, sketchy claw that may or may not work. <laughs> and then a couple other things, and we settled on a gigantic game of perfection. If you don't know what perfection is, is a is it a board game? Um, nah, it's a, it's a it's game. in the board game either. aisle, I guess. Yeah. So it's a plasticky kind of game. It has a timer. You push down this spring-loaded plate, and it has a bunch of pockets for uh, these shapes that are on pegs. And you have to race against the clock to put all of your little pegs in the little pockets. And if you don't, the whole spring-loaded board releases, and all the pieces shoot up, and it's ah. Uh, so it's you know it's fun. <laughs> It's fun and terror. Yeah. A little bit together. So we made one of those. So that was a, a much clearer direction because we had a game that we could go off of. And yeah, it was, just we had a reference. Yeah, Make it bigger. Yeah. Solve all the problems that come along with trying to make something that's meant to spring and explode upward up against a wall where that would happen at somebody. That was the big change was we changed the orientation of the whole thing, which adds a new set of problems that the original game... Obviously, making it way bigger mm -hmm. adds problems, but also just standing it up on its side added a bunch of problems. So, Like what? Uh, well, getting... I mean, when the game is laying on a table, gravity holds the pieces in place, and they don't have to be tight. When you stand it up on a mm -hmm. wall, you have to be, they have to be tight enough to stay in place, but loose enough to pop out when they're forced out. And then you have the compounded friction of 25 pieces all working together working against whatever it is you're trying to use to push them out so and some geometric shapes were easier to do uh, that process was easier on certain shapes than it was yeah. on others because of like corners and like pinch points and things and so it was neat it was a it was a complex project i wonder what it would be like to do <clears throat> how long and how interesting or not interesting it would be to do a video that covered all of the stuff that we think about going into a project. Because mm. there's so much conversation, like especially something like that. Mm -hmm. There were so many brainstorming, so many iterations. Mm -hmm. We so had a many, weekly like, call for, what, about like four yeah. weeks? We had... But even just between you and I, it was like, oh, well, yeah. we started out with one mechanism and then we talked about why that wouldn't work and how we could improve it. And we went to a different one and then to a different one. And then when we got there, we had to iterate through it a couple of times. And like... Not that people really necessarily need to know all that, but it would be interesting to try to put all of the parts of a project into the video rather than just a quick little summation of, here's how we got here, now we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Here's kind of what I thought at <laughs> the end, you know, because that's like a pretty small percentage of like the overall time spent on figuring things out and trying things. And, yep. Yeah. Because, I mean... The physical game looked like the the 3D model that we made. Mm -hmm. So that looked like a huge win. If we were just going to make a big prop, then yeah. But it had to be a functioning, like playable, durable, repeatable you know, uh, piece of hardware. And that's the piece that, that is theoretical. That you can only plan so much. You can only talk out so much. You can only buy enough components in a short kind of planning period and then realized that some things worked like a champ and took a lot less time with them. Some things didn't work really at all the way we had planned on and we have to work through and change and you know, adapt and overcome. And I mean, those are the things that don't make it into the video mm -hmm. because it doesn't make for good storytelling or it's a huge kind of time uh, eater. Yeah, for the viewer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I wonder if there is value in that. I mean, uh, maybe. Well, for people that are design, I would say for people that are designing or trying to manage a project like in that for me academically there's a lot of value hmm. because it a lot of people when you say like are oh, you're going to go to matter hackers and you're going to work on a project so okay i mean we build things here and it doesn't translate to just building something here and then flying it to california right. and then yeah. putting it on the wall it was a whole different set of stuff yeah there's using other people's tools yeah. in a space you don't know you don't have all the little things that you're used to the logistics of, you know, where are people going to stay? How are they going to eat? Are you going to work on someone else's time schedule? Because we're on East Coast time and they're on, what, Pacific? Pacific yep. time? Yep. Who's going to be there to let us in the building? If we need to work later, you know, how is that going to work? 
And so there's a lot of little nuance project information that kind of gets glossed over, especially when you watch a video, you know, an eight to 10 minute video where it's everything kind of just comes together. Yeah. And that's really not realistic. Yeah. And it may not even make sense to put that stuff in there, you know, really, because that's not the value that we're trying to offer. True. Um, I mean, it would be interesting to try it one time in the right situation. And it may hit, may not, but <clears throat> it's not that struggle or that um, information is not really the core of what we're trying to do. So, And I you're really not trying to miss. plan for a struggle. Like, inevitably, it's <laughs> yeah. going to come. Yeah. <laughs> but sure. it's not like, okay, which piece of this is going to mess up and is going to be a really good drama? video? Yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, you're a, you know, a TV show at that point trying yeah. to instill a bunch of drama when it really doesn't need to be there. But that's also, I think that's, I mean, it's not fun in the moment. But I think as a maker, like that's the true test of your metal. When you can go like, okay, our plan, we had to take everything with us. So we're planning on bringing these things. We're planning on some contingency. Maybe we'll need this. Maybe we'll need that. When all of that goes out of the window, then you got to come up with something on the fly. Yeah. And everybody's staring at you trying to figure <laughs> out what you're going to do next. <laughs> Uh, you yeah. got to make it happen. And like me, when you forget to zip your backpack up and you pick oh. up your backpack and your camera falls out and your lens explodes on the floor, what do you do then? That happened. That sucked. Yeah, that did suck. Um, but, I mean, the good thing was we were able to find a replacement lens. Mm -hmm. Josh just had to take a little drive through California to get it. But we got it. Yep. It worked out. How stressed were you? I actually wasn't that stressed. Um, I think I'm getting better at realizing what's in my control and what's not. And very little is. So in a situation like that, I think I'm getting a little bit better at like, well, okay, let's just keep moving ahead. You know, I knew that we had a GoPro. Worst case, we could shoot the rest of it on our phones. I mean, there are ways around all that stuff. It's just mm -hmm. not ideal, but like, it's not the end of the world. So, how did I do with the stress? I think you did well. I think at the end, when we couldn't get the mechanism working like we wanted to, and it was eight o'clock in the last night, and everybody else was gone home, we were both frustrated. But I think it was, it seemed in the moment easier for me to be like, okay, we're done. And I'm not going to feel bad about it. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to let it continue to frustrate me. I feel like I got there first. And then oh, you, yeah. got, you got there soon after. I'm still not there. <laughs> okay. No. Like, yeah, that's, I don't know. That's the, the deep rooted, I guess, part of my professional upbringing is that you make it happen. Like, you can't just, I'm not saying that we gave up, we threw in a towel. Like, all, all the reasons that we stopped or that we made that project what it is right now are completely valid. And responsibly, I had to step back and I had to acknowledge all of those things. And it was pretty late and I was pretty exhausted. And so were you. There were happy people that were playing the game, yeah. which I think I had to focus on. I go, are the, the people that are here right now with this, are they enjoying it? Yes. So why am I not enjoying it with them? Or why am I putting a damper on this thing that they're clearly excited about? Just yeah. because it doesn't do the thing that I... And it may be because I, I designed a lot of it. And so I took it to heart. Yeah, right. Um, and I guess professionally, like, this is a project that I had a whole lot of, of involvement in. and More so than some. Yeah, and I, I wanted to see it end up exactly like it should have been. And that right. wasn't the case. And... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's one it of those... It didn't take me longer, you're right. It's one of those things like with expectations about things, whether your expectations for something or someone else's expectations of you, you know, there comes a point where you have to like look at like were they my expectations worth continuing to try to reach. And like you said, the people were having fun with the game. If we could step out of like the situation mm -hmm. and see like it, the game functions. It does really what it's supposed to do. It looks really cool. It looks great. It's huge. It's the space well. People are enjoying it. They're going to enjoy it in the office. And so our expectation of it being a certain thing kind of doesn't really matter at that point. Yep. Um, yeah, it's just 
you know, and it was frustrating because it, it's one of those things we were like, it felt like we were really close to getting it solved the whole time. Yep. And it was like, ah, oh, it's just one more thing. Like there's got to be another way yep. to do it. And there's another way to do it. I and remember then, at a and certain then it, point. It was like, it was like uh, diminishing returns. Yes. The harder we tried, the more frustrated we got, the more tired yep. we got, and we weren't getting any closer to a solve. And that point was exactly what I acknowledged. Yeah. So, uh, Cause I mean, I was walking around their warehouse going like, there is an answer to this problem. I just have to find it. Yeah. And the MacGyver in me was kicking in and like my mullet was growing as I'm walking around this room going like, <laughs> no, there's, there's the thing. Yeah. And it's going to reveal itself. I'm going, aha. And we'll go in there and then we'll do a little heel clicker and we'll walk out victorious. And then like my ability to search for stuff just started like drooping. Yeah. And just walked around in circles um, and then I stopped and I saw those guys playing with it and having fun and looking at it and being super impressed. And you could hear all the people in the office because it's you know, like a packed like yeah. business. So it's like, oh my God, look at that thing. Look, oh, that's super cool. And like, so you hear the excitement and the scuttle behind you. And that's when I just stopped and go like, they're, they're digging this. Yeah. Let them enjoy it and don't walk around being all humbug because it's not exactly the way that I wanted it to be, but it's not mine. True. And I mean, you know, it's 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 not dead either. It can be they have ideas about how they can continue to work on it, and you know, there's always additions and improvements you can make to anything. We just happened to stop at a point that was before we wanted to stop. Um, but just like anything, there can be improvements that continue can continue to be made. So, <clears throat> and that's not to put this project as a failure in any light. I know we're talking about ways we could have done it better. I mean, so what were you excited about? I was excited about how much we actually got done in three days. And even though there were things that we actively marked off the list, like, yep, this one we're just not going to do. And then this one we can't seem to figure out. If you look at it, when we went out there, there was a stack of plywood. And when we left, there was this, what, six foot by eight foot by one <laughs> foot giant painted thing on the wall with 25 squares on it with shapes cut out with leds in it with glued on letters and details and arduino in it and gameplay and a pvc rack that was had tension on it that would you know i mean yep. we did a lot of stuff we did in a very short amount of time and so i'm happy about that you know we worked hard we stayed on schedule we worked around a whole lot of stuff that we weren't expecting and that, that, that's a win you know and again, they're happy with it. That's a win. So, definitely. Yeah. Cool. I wish we'd had more time to like relax there because we were going pretty hard the whole time. Mm hmm. But, you know, that's, that's work. That's just the way that goes. And I mean, in the project managing kind of collaboration thing, and this is, this is all input and feedback. Because if you got it perfectly right the first time, then I don't think your project was difficult enough or no, that's true. complex enough. So the next time now we know, talking to Dave, we need to add in like a just a surfing day, <laughs> yeah, flat out day to go surfing, um, and and what we can do better. What am I doing? Yeah. Um, it's interesting though. Like <clears throat> I was thinking about this. There's. When I travel for work, most of the traveling that I've done is to an event to where I go and I may have work to do. I may have to like be on a panel or do a talk or do a show or do something while I'm there. But that's usually a very small segment of the trip mm -hmm. overall. And so there's a lot of like hanging out, talking to people and meeting new people and going to this gathering and that gathering. And there's a lot of that stuff. And the two times I've gone out there and then a couple of other trips that have been, uh, like at the time I went to L.A. to film that stuff for Vox for an entire week, those are 100% work morning to night, sleep in a hotel morning to night kind of situations. And it's weird because that's not really most of what my work travel is. Hmm. And I, I realized that like while we were there, we were sitting in the hotel room and like I think we wanted to watch a movie, but we were both too tired to watch oh, yeah. a movie. Yeah, that wouldn't happen. I was like, huh. Like this is not bad. It was just mm -hmm. it dawned on me that like what well, most of my work trips are not really like this. 
you know. I think most of my professional work trips um, were, were meetings, kind of like that same thing. It was a meeting. I had to sit around and just receive or give information. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of downtime. And it was really boring because I felt like I left my family for, for what? For me to get up and give like a three-minute briefing yeah, and then listen to two or three hours. But you had to be there the day before because the meeting, for some reason, wanted to start at six in the morning the next day. And so there was a lot of just unnecessary downtime. Mm-hmm. So like I've been to a lot of places and I've seen a lot of things just in that kind of wiggle room, which is not complaining about. But there was no real sense of accomplishment in any of those meetings to where this project, like I felt like we made something awesome and we were there for a reason. And the amount of time that we allotted other than the hiccups that we faced, like the time allotted was pretty spot on Mm -hmm. like to get that stuff done. Yeah, that's true. That is true. We both watched, uh, a quiet place Mm -hmm. on the, on the plane ride separately. What did you think about it? I liked it. I liked it too. I don't like that kind of movie. I don't like spooky, like suspenseful, like there's something in the shadows. Let's just Mm -hmm. act freaked out all the time. I don't like those. But there's something about the concept for that movie that I was really interested in. So I said, well, I'll try it. If I don't enjoy it, I'll just turn it off. It's not a big deal. And it was really good. I don't know if we should spoil it, but there's a moment in it. Okay, a, a little spoiler if you haven't seen it. <clears throat> when she's going up the stairs and she pulls the thing and then the nail pops out and it zoomed in on the nail, mm-hmm. I could, I just, my stomach turned. I was Mine like, man, too. that is going through somebody's foot yep. in a minute. And I, this is, no, it's just going to no. make everything worse. Like, yep. I don't want to see that go into somebody's foot. And so for the next, like, 20 minutes, I'm just waiting. <laughs> is it this time? Is it, uh, okay, it, that means it's still coming. Is it this time? And then when it finally did, I just about wanted to punch the seat in front of me. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh man, that's what I love about a movie. Oh. And I, that's you're gonna show me, you're gonna foreshadow the crap out of this moment, and I'm gonna dread it. Yeah. And I know it's coming, and even though I know it's there, it's still impactful and emotional when it happens. It's usually that type of thing, though. When it's so obvious that this thing is set up, it feels cheap to me. Anyway, it's like. Hmm. You know, yeah. when it zooms in on the gun in the corner and you're yeah. like, oh, somebody's going to die by that thing. That's easy to see. But this one, like, it was just like she didn't notice it. And I know, obviously, somebody's going to step on the nail and it's going to go right through their foot. And that sucks. And I don't want to listen to that or see it. <laughs> but I don't know. Something about that one felt like it was it was well placed and yeah. it had a payoff. But man, ugh. felt gross. So the premise of this movie, if you haven't seen it, uh, or just think it's just another scary movie, is there's like I guess aliens or something. That I don't know. They never it, explain yeah. who the what the monster slash alien slash whatever have inhabited the Earth and kill things like super aggressively. Yeah. When they by sound, so they hear it. So they can't see things. They're blind. They can only hear things. So there's this family that has a deaf daughter, and so. The, she can't obviously can't hear anything and they're communicating through sign language and like the really ingenious ways they found just to stay quiet. Mm-hmm. I thought was pretty great. They all their paths were covered in sand. So they weren't crunching on anything and the systems of lights and stuff set up. Uh, it was really, really well made. It was, it was, it was a cool idea. John Krasinski directed that movie. Yep. So way to go, Jim. Go Jim. He's been in a lot of stuff lately. The new mm-hmm. Jack Ryan series on Hulu. Have you finished that? Yes. No, Amazon Prime. Oh, what, yeah. Yes, I did. Okay. We're like four episodes in. It is pretty awesome. I used to read Tom Clancy books. I've read three or four. My dad was a huge fan, so they were always around. Gotcha. Um, how did how does the character and the stories around it match up to the tone of the, I know the, story, the books are different stories, but... Yeah, there were a bunch of different stories, and like his backstory in the miniseries is different from his backstory in the book. Mm-hmm. But you kind of get over that. It has some of the same qualities, like Jack Ryan in the books was in a helicopter crash, but he was in a helicopter crash when he was at the the Naval Academy. Hmm. And so him in the miniseries, like he was a Marine and got in a helicopter crash, and like right. you get a lot of angst and you get a lot of backstory for people, and it, it it's really good. The characters are really well developed. In the miniseries and in the book, 
and it takes you on these weird tangents in the the miniseries that you're like yeah. what in the world we, am i watching we hit Ooh. one of those and i'm like wow uh, the, yeah the one uh, wow. yeah wow hmm. and it's it's just like the spirit of the book where you're definitely, like definitely a mature show yes put it that way um so in the book like you're you're about to hit like a really important point in the main storyline and then boom you'll get sidetracked and be introduced to a completely new character and go like okay. what am i doing here yeah just to learn that, that person eventually circles around and like the the butterfly that flaps its wings will create a typhoon like something like that like everybody's connected somehow you're just not privy to it yet and so that's a tom clancy thing he yep. does a lot of that gotcha is he still alive no he is not bummer yep but yeah i'm looking forward to to finishing it up um we just with traveling we got cut off in the middle of it so well my wife and i were having a little debate um whether they were going to so this is like a season one i don't even know if they even call them seasons yeah. but if the season will come to a close and so i think we're trying to when we were about as far as you guys were we were trying to figure out the uh, the studio ness of this or like no they have to keep it going or like will this whole storyline resolve itself in this series or will they just do a netflix like painfully drag it out and then hmm. a year and a half from now maybe i'll get resolution <clears throat> to it uh but they did it really well yeah that's what i, I kind of figure that they would make it standalone that's what i was expecting anyway and he's also in this movie that we tried to watch yesterday on netflix about like a robot and this girl, what was the name of it? I have no idea. I know it's sort of a big Hero Six esque type thing. Huh. As this teenage girl, and you get through the just the opening credits, like all her angst, and she befriends this prototype kind of robot, and who's voiced by John Krasinski? Like, huh? He's everywhere. Yeah, he is everywhere. Good for him. Yeah, for real. Um. I was going to ask you about a movie. Ah, now I don't remember what it was. We watched a lot of movies this trip. I say that we didn't have a lot of downtime, but it's a lot of airplane travel. Yeah, yeah, that's true. The airplane travel kind of. I watched uh, Infinity War again. Just as good. I've seen it three times now. It's <laughs> been just as good every time. It's an excellent movie. It is. Excellent. Oh, we watched uh, uh, E.T. So hmm. remember I told you a few weeks ago, Jenny and I watched E.T. to see if it was all right for the kids. Mm-hmm. So our youngest got grounded, <laughs> so he had to go to bed early, and we were like, oh, the older three are still up. Let's watch E.T. That way we don't have to worry about, like, you know, making sure it's all right for the youngest. They loved it. Oh, that's good. Loved it. They got a little freaked out at the beginning because they didn't know what was going on, and we yeah. told them, like, it's going to seem scary. It's not actually scary. It's just you don't know what's happening yeah. yet, and they were totally cool with it. They loved the movie, uh, and that was, that was a lot of fun. So Deacon has seen Infinity War, and I had to talk to him last night about, I mean, your kids haven't seen it. Right. So it was sitting out on, the, like, our entertainment center, and I'm like, you have to not talk about this around the Claggett kids. Yeah. Okay. But I saw, what, I saw the John Wicks. Oh, both yeah. Both of them. That's right. Because our flight got canceled the first day, so we had, like, three or four hours to kill, so we just came back home and went to our respective houses. Not that we share a home. <laughs> And I watched the first John Wick, and then we watched the second one in the hotel room that night. Uh, it was good. They're fun, right? Yeah, they're lighthearted and family. <laughs> it, was, it was really fun. It's, like, it's a straight-up comic book. I mean, it's just... And that's what I liked about it. I thought it was just like the a sake whole of action. bunch of killing, which it is. But it's in the visual styling of a comic book, which I thought was super cool. I'm really interested to see what the third one's going to be like. Yeah. And I really like that uh, kind of hotel for scoundrels type thing. Like, yeah. There's a weird underbelly, uh, like the superhero uh, cafe and the how it should have ended. Oh, yeah. Like, do they all just kind of get together? There's a code, I suppose. Yep. You can order room service if you want a bunch of guns or you want a doctor. I thought that was a, a cool storyline that they kept going. Yeah, it was pretty cool. What am I doing? Um, so we're, we're going to finish up Jack Ryan, but also, um, we still haven't seen Luke Cage season two. I haven't seen Luke Cage season one. I kind of fell off of, yeah, like Iron Fist. 
And if it's kind of like two is out as well. Yeah, it got me off of the the defenders. Is that what they are? They're called. Yeah. All together. Yeah. That whole like group of people. Like I still like Daredevil. Not watch Daredevil, but the other two never really held my interest very much. Luke Cage is good. Okay. I I liked it a lot more than I thought I would, and it's you know all of them will have moments where you make you squeamish and stuff, but. Luke Cage, the thing I liked about him is, uh, or about the way the guy that played him, <clears throat> is he feels like a legitimate good guy, like he's trying to do the right thing, and he keeps getting pulled back into like this bad situation. Whereas like uh, Iron Fist, he's a weenie. He's like a weenie with powers. He's a rich kid. He's a rich kid, and he whines and he's entitled. Yeah. And I still kind of liked it just because I like kung fu stuff, and so. Even though it, it wasn't super well done, and he was definitely the worst part of the show, I still kind of liked the season, so I'm kind of looking forward to season two. I'm hoping that they will make him grow up a little bit in this season mm. to improve, you know, like the... He just won't be as whiny. I thought the, the trailer for season two was better than all that I had seen of season one. Yeah. And the, se- the trailer for season one was the same way. I was like, dude, this is going to be awesome. Some, like... Wu Tang in the background or mm-hmm. whatever it was, and this dude like fighting with a glowing hand. It's like sweet, and then it ended up being. Meh. I kept hollering at them to get on with it. Yeah. Like, yeah. But Luke Cage, um, I, I think it'd be worth a watch. Mm-hmm. I think you'd like it. What else did we watch? I watched. Um, I watch. I watched Deadpool, hmm. finally. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't something I had just been like saving up to watch, but it was on the plane, and they had both of them, so I was like, "Yeah, hey, whatever." I watched Deadpool. Uh, it was surprise, like it's raunchy and and dirty, as everybody should know by this point, because it's been out forever. <laughs> but surprisingly, like it was an entertaining movie. I like movies that are self-aware, especially if you're surrounded in a weird context, like Marvel movies are. Like it's it because it tiptoes down the line. Like he has a relationship with Spider Man. He also has a relationship with the X Men and X Force. And so it's in this weird MCU Fox kind of thing. Like it knows its place, hmm. and it's able to point out all the little funny things. It made fun of Ryan Reynolds and Green Lantern at a certain point. Um, the story was compelling. I think. I will go back on what I said last week because I don't like how characters from one movie are put in another movie. Ryan Reynolds is perfect for this role. Hmm. I I totally believe him. Hmm. Hands down. I could see that, but I don't like it. Like, from what I've never seen either one of the movies, but from what I've seen of like clips of his attitude and his pluckiness and his, Mm -hmm. I was like, man, I don't want to watch that. That's the character. Like, that, that doesn't sound interesting to me at all. And I don't like, uh, you know, you said you like when they, they are aware, or self-aware. Mm-hmm. I don't like that. The thing I enjoy about movies is that they are somewhere else, that they are a thing that I don't... Like they're not real, you know? Like, I like that escapism of movies. I like yeah. going to a different place and being engulfed in, like, a different world or a different time or a different something. And then when they break the fourth wall, I'm just like, oh, yeah, it's, it's kind of... It breaks the fourth wall yeah many times yeah it, it, at one point heard, i've heard that many it times. broke the fourth wall while breaking the fourth wall and he made a comment about it and he's like it's like 16 walls yeah so yeah that's not interesting to me personally i started to watch it i pushed the button i told you this earlier like i pushed the button and the fox logo came up and i heard the little da 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 yeah. i was like oh i want to watch star wars <laughs> <laughs> that was the I had that feeling of like I want to watch A New Hope like that's the thing that started out those movies and so I knew it wasn't Star Wars and I knew it wasn't on there but the next shot is like the credits rolling and the this dude falling backwards with like a gunshot in his head and I'm like man oh the slow motion I don't, yeah I don't yeah. want to see this like I just immediately knew that I wasn't in the mood maybe someday but I wasn't in the mood so I had nothing else to do there's there something were, else I watched I don't remember what it was. It was after The Quiet Place. I tried to watch Blazing Saddles because I had never seen it. And that movie is like riddled with 1970s like okay language that's horribly not okay and wasn't okay in any yeah. time. Like they use really, really foul language. Even for for Deadpool, 
Yeah. I watched. I sat through Deadpool being okay with the language and not watching Blazing Saddles. Like that was yeah. a line I felt like I was uncomfortably crossing. Yeah, we watched it one time because somebody was talking in like, I don't know, not ten or fifteen years ago or something. Somebody was talking about, oh, it's like one of the best. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, mm-hmm. well, we'll give it a shot. And I was just like cringing the entire time. Like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to watch this. Yeah, it's not I don't, funny. I don't want to like this. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Um. Uh, there was another movie that I wanted to talk about though that we haven't talked about. I don't know what it was. Um, I gotta write them down. I don't know. We both finished our line. Well, well, bag, bag four, bag four. How many bags are in this? Did you like sixteen? Some crazy. Uh, fourteen, at least. I saw sixteen. No, sixteen. Yeah, yeah. sixteen bags. That's nuts, so. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we're like 35 minutes in. Do you want to do some uh, pros and cons? Do we have any? You said you had some left I over had from some. Brent, right? they're, they're, they're not as good as the We other had somebody ones. email us. Oh, oh, I actually did have an idea here. Something I wanted to talk about. This is kind of dumb. <laughs> just a little bit? A little, just a little bit. Um, what do you think about heirlooms? Like a family heirloom? Yes. Uh, I don't... Uh, the con not not specific things the concept of a thing being passed just in some object whatever you oh. imagine it to be to be passed down yeah. from family member to family member for the sake of it being in the family i like it okay. i like that concept <clears throat> um i think especially in a throwaway culture that we have now that it's good to have something that you can connect back with real life family members um because my family is all like really country super like west virginia country they never had anything worth valuing enough to hand down to people Hmm. and so when i started woodworking i'm like i envisioned a thing that i could make i'm like i have to make this good enough that people would want to pass it down so that excites me that i could have a connection potentially with three or four generations of people and they could look back in some book and see a stupid picture of me throwing up some white kid gang sign or whatever in middle school that's the only print picture left that they go that's that's my great 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 granddad (laughs) and so i like the idea of having like a connection to your family because excuse me mine wasn't really well documented or known Hmm. and so i don't know my family in my mind only goes back one generation or hmm. two gen like my grandparents everything after that like pretty much didn't exist to me because there's yeah. no pictures other than right. some really old tarnished ones yeah so i i like the idea that there is something that someone can have such an emotional attachment to that helps create that story where other people may just have stories about their family yeah can kind of take the place yeah I kind of go back and forth on this because I, part of me really likes the idea of having something carried through a long family line. And then there's another part of me that's like, it's just stuff. Like, Mm -hmm. it could be, I don't know, maybe I'm related to King Arthur and like Excalibur gets passed down family (laughs) after family after family and it ends up and I have Excalibur. It's still a sword. It's still a... it's still a thing that in and of itself doesn't have any value, and it actually doesn't connect me. I'm not disagreeing with you. This is just the one of the sides I've thought through. Mm-hmm. It doesn't actually connect me to anybody before. It's just a thing that we had in common. And, you know, part of me feels bad about feeling that way because it, like, devalues something that someone else valued in the past that wanted to connect, you know, down the line. But then part of me is just like, I, I don't know. I I feel real strongly that this everything's going to burn. This is all going away. None of this stuff matters mm-hmm. eventually down, you know, at some point. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I, I'm kind of caught between those two things of, like, it certainly doesn't hurt to have an heirloom. Yeah. But it's like, I don't know that I would go out of my way to hang on to a thing just because it was a thing that someone in my family had before. This came up... Um, Partially because my wife has a few pieces of furniture that are from her great-grandparents, I guess. And when you look at them, they are not handmade. They are not nice. They are not fancy. 
They were bought at a store made in a factory. Okay. Okay. So right. it's not like great granddad made the table. And, and if that's the case, it doesn't matter how nice the table is, right? Great granddad made the table and that's why you want it. Cause it was a handmade thing of the person. Sometimes somebody spends a whole lot of money on a thing and it's, it's nice. It has mm-hmm. its own like monetary or whatever value. And so you want to keep it for that. It has value on its own. So she has some of this furniture that has no value. It wasn't made by a person. It's not worth anything. It's just furniture that they had in their house that they probably didn't really, you know. Yep. But it's interesting the way that the the difference between she and I will look at. I have some furniture of my grandparents, but like I don't I don't really care. It, it's cool to have. It's nice to know that it would that they had it. But if it were gone, I wouldn't probably even notice the difference. Whereas she wants to hold on to stuff simply because it was in a great grandparent's house. So, not, that's not right or wrong. It's no. just like, it's interesting to, to be confronted with two people who <laughs> are in the same position uh, to our future family. Three generations from now, we are great granddad, yeah. great grandmom. We are those people. And we have a different way of looking at the ways that our stuff is going to be passed on or the stuff was passed on to us. I don't know. Well, I think, I don't know. I, I think I have a unique perspective is that we had some of those things and we purposely downsized. So right. I had to look at the stuff in my house. I go, this doesn't mean enough to me to take up floor space in like a storage area. Yes or no. Or do I have to hang on to this or how deep really is my emotional connection to connection to X? Uh, like we bought this piano when we were in Belgium. That belonged to a really good friend's family from long ago. It was from the 1830s or something. It was a beautiful piano. I don't know how to play the piano. It was just gorgeous. And it had a story. Mm-hmm. But it had a story to me. Uh, I was told by a couple people that the piano like would never be in tune. It was just something cute to look at. So when we were getting rid of all of our stuff, like that one kind of hurt because it had a story. But when it was gone, I never really thought about it. Yeah. Um, the furniture that you talk about, I think... My uh, desire to have that heirloom is that it is still functional because of its quality. That if I could make something like the the table that I made. I thought about it the other day when I was reading through Screen Free Parenting. I'm like, where are your kids going to be or who are they going to be? I'm like, which one of these kids is A, even going to care that this table is still around? Or it's just like the table that they eat and spill milk on? Or are they going to argue over it about who's going to get it? Hmm. And is it going to survive, you know, that long? It's a walnut table. Like, they could make a walnut table. But that's a, it, it is a piece of functional furniture yeah. that also was made by someone that they know and love and was a family member or that was crafted with such quality that it can and very well should survive the test of time. So when my mom went back to college uh, in her late 30s, she did a, a lineage project. So she made this, this big family tree and in that family tree, she wrapped it up inside of a cookbook. So she has all of her aunts and grandmothers and little like post-it note kind of cards that like the Nestle's Toll House thing was originally found on. Like she's got those photocopied in this big book. So I'm like, wow, this is cool. This is a connection to people from long ago mm-hmm. that could easily be resurrected into now. Like it's, it's neat. But you look on there and it's like open a box of this. Combine it with a like container of this. Stir, heat, and eat. So it's not mm. like grandma's super secret recipe that she yeah. doesn't want to share to anybody that won some awards. It was like, get a box of rice aroni, add cut up spam chunks. <laughs> and so it's kind of, I mean, not, not to diss the furniture, but it's kind of in that same light. Like, did if the person long ago didn't really come up with it or value it enough to make it their own, like deeply their own and take that intestinal kind of like attachment to it. How can they expect me many generations removed to take that same attachment? Yeah. <clears throat> and and so if I got, I hope hundred years from now, people don't have my Ikea furniture in their house thinking it was something that their great grandfather <laughs> valued because right. I mean, it didn't. <clears throat> yeah. There are those things that may get left to the side because it may not be in style yeah. in the future with the flying cars and the jetpacks or whatever. Like, I don't know. It's, it's a, I, I get your question and I get your, uh, your stance on it. 
I wouldn't go, kids, I made this thing. You are going to hold on to yeah. this forever. Give right. this to your Love children. Love this thing. Yes. This right. is an icon that will represent me long after I'm dead. Like, that's not a thing. Yeah. Um, but if they, they will inevitably form like an emotional tie to something that they associate with me. Yeah. And if that association is strong enough or if it gets brought up, like they'll eventually maybe tell their kids. And so it may be an heirloom by accident. Yeah. Cause I don't, I don't feel like I, there may be entire generations like this was my dad's iPhone. He was on it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> he loved it so much. <laughs> like that may be a weird situation. Uh, and furniture for years ago may have been like, you know, baby boomers had their first piece of nice furniture. Yeah. Or I remember my, my family with a cookbook, it was real basic and simple stuff because they didn't have a lot of food. And so they just made it work with, you know, with what they had. And so yeah. it seems really kind of trashy and not like a really solid meal on paper because that's what they had to work with. Yeah. And so I don't have those same problems. So I'm not about writing down like my recipe for the only thing we have to eat. Right. And so the contextually, it'll be completely different for yeah. our kids. Right. <clears throat> so part of the reason that this whole thing came up, I mean, I was thinking about this when we moved into this house in a different context. But the reason I wanted to talk about it is because as I started buying parts for R2-D2, it dawned on me that at some point, I'm going to have a fully functioning R2-D2. And at some point, I'm going to die. Hmm. And at some point, somebody's going to go, hmm, what do we do with that thing? Along with all the other junk. I mean, that's not just, but that like is one abnormal object most people in the world will not have. And so it made me wonder, like, are my kids going to like, kind of, are they going to fight over R2-D2? Are they not going to want it because it's big and it runs on ancient batteries from mm -hmm. 2018, you know? I feel um, like dibs is appropriate here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just saying. But, but it, you know, yeah. like that's a thing that I'm going to spend a lot of time and a lot of money on. Mm -hmm. And it will be a thing for the people who like Star Wars for how many ever generations it's fashionable. That's a thing that pretty much anybody would like. Is, is that R2-D2 free? I'm going to take that thing. Of course mm -hmm. I'll take that thing. It's sitting right there. Nobody wants it. It's the guy that made it's dead. Like... So yeah. it made me think about like that and you know just some of the other stuff that I'm spending my time making. The arcade may not stand up to the test of time as far as construction. So a lot of the stuff I make may not last from a construction perspective because it's not supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, but you know things that are really unique, like is that's like the katana. What about that guitar over there? Yeah. I mean, so the, I'm that's pointing only, to the, the very first good, very first really project that you made here in the shop of your grandfather. Yeah. Right? It has huge emotional attachment to you. Only me. Only you. Right. And so unfortunately, like if you were to pass away, like when I was unboxing things, I didn't know the significance of that until I accidentally turned it over and saw, you know, scribbled Bobby Claggett cursive handwriting. Like yeah. it, it doesn't look like a finished piece of anything. Right. So would they find the value in it or make that association from you know deep lineage to their dad yeah so that's that's hard i don't know if they would or not and, and i guess the the part of me that says like everything's gonna burn <laughs> is that like i don't care yeah. it doesn't matter to me like I, I don't expect them to care about that thing or this table or the arcade i think they'll remember them yeah because they were of the age to where like we have an arcade in our not everybody has an arcade in their living room that's interesting. And so I, maybe they'll be attached to those things. But like that guitar and some of the other stuff I've made that they've never really interacted with, I didn't. I wouldn't care that they were cared or didn't care about the object. That doesn't matter to me. But I think the things that are unique, like the arcade and like an R2-D2, that are going to stand out as like, you know, like the kind of thing you would go to school as a eight or nine-year-old and be like, dude, we have an R2-D2. <laughs> Nobody else in this school has an R2-D2. You know, like, those are the things that I still don't care if they want them or not. It's not going to hurt my feelings mm -hmm. if it all goes in the garbage. But those are the things that I kind of wonder about. Like, are they going to end up trying to figure out, like, who gets R2-D2 when I die? <laughs> or, I don't know. It's just well, I think that, so heirlooms <clears throat> being a physical manifestation of history. 
So maybe, I mean, not say maybe, all of these things in their physical form may not be valuable. But like the concept and the abilities and the things that you have instilled because of them. Hmm. And so just that same, like I had an arcade and I had an R2D2 and I had all these, all those things. Like, yeah, those are physical, tangible things that they may not continue to have or they may not work or their space batteries may not be rechargeable <laughs> or whatever. I mean, because I still have old 35 millimeter reel to reel that has my mom on it as like a little yeah. girl. Like I've never watched it because I don't want to watch that. Like, yeah, it has no sound. Like, right. come on, man. Like I got on my dad's VHS tapes. Like, was this garbage? It has value to somebody, but the thing may not have value to them. But those memories that they have, or the springboardedness of the um, the skills that they may have learned, or the inspiration that they've seen, or the just the concept of what is possible. Yeah. Because before, like this maker movement, like arcade cabinets are in arcades. Arcades have gone the way. And they're in dusty old places that I can maybe pay $2,000 for an obscure game that I maybe not have played very often. And I go, oh, you can have one in your house, and it can have hundreds of games. Like, wait, what? That's a thing? Yeah. And then I discovered that in my 30s. Like, our kids are able to discover things or the possibility of taking an idea into reality at a staggeringly young age. So I think you're exactly right that all this stuff can burn and it would there would be a tear but the idea that like yeah you can totally do that there's no reason you can't do this thing because my dad has showed me how or my dad has been the example that i can i think that is the piece that yeah will and absolutely should like change your family tree and like yeah flood the generations down the line and those are the things that i'm like actively trying to do now is get out of my old heirlooms of like here's here's a frying pan that belonged to your so and so and so and so like that doesn't mean anything to me, but my family would hold on to those things just because it belonged to somebody else down the line. Right. It has no value. I don't know the person. It doesn't have a story. And so I'm trying to instill the ability for my kids to not hold on to that thing. To go forward and and make more or discover more or don't be <clears throat> limited to the past or don't be limited yeah. to my generation. Right. Like, let me show you in the tiniest way, like what is possible. And then you go forward and just yeah. blaze a trail somewhere else. Don't hold on <laughs> yeah. to this table. If you don't want it, don't exactly. Hold on to it just because you think it's going to make me sad. Yeah. Cause it, I think that's an important, will. that's an important thing to let kids know. And it wouldn't kids me children, not kids. Anybody who is a child who has parents, at some point in their life, they should know, if that's, I guess, for us, that we don't expect or would not be upset if they didn't want our stuff. Yeah. Because I know that there's a lot of people, like in my parents' generation, who are now in the process of going through their parents' stuff, and there's a lot of guilt there. Like, do, mm -hmm. I, do I let go of the one thing I have that connects me to my parents? Physical thing. Right. Because there's also, like, the whole, the digital side of stuff. Our kids can go on, when we're gone, can go on YouTube because our channels will probably still be there. And they can see videos of us doing things. They can hear us speak. They can see us acting as we normally acted as human beings. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of us. That was the whole reason I started my channel. Yeah. Was to have that catalog of me working with my kids. But like, I guess we could theoretically have that with our parents in this generation right now. Mm -hmm. Our parents don't really have that. Yeah. They may have some home videos, but then you go back one more generation past that, doesn't exist. Right. There is no sound. There is no moving picture. You may have a photo. You go back one more generation, two more generations past that, there are no photos. And it just fades away so quickly. And and then when you look forward in time, it's like right now we can say, oh, well, it's cool because our kids can like go back when they're older and we're gone. They can go back and watch videos and they can see what we did and they can look through all the millions of photos we have on our phone of them as children and as us as a family. That's cool. And then one generation past that, they're like, oh, our grandkids can do the same thing. And then you go one generation Maybe. past that. And then they're like, I have literally four million photos of my family over the last four generations. I'm mm -hmm. not going to go through that. Or if you even have the means to do it. Like, well, yeah. If it becomes the 35 millimeter, like that was my mom. That's not even right. like grandkids. Like I have no way to watch that. Other, if I like held it up to a light and just like, whoo, 
who pulled it really fast. Like, yeah. there's no way for me to actually view those things. And well, so, there is. It's just like, well, is it worthwhile yeah. you you okay you know, going down the digital stuff? I think it's it's the barrier to be able to view file formats and all that stuff is is very different than like having the right projector. Right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's it's a weird we're in a space right now where there's going to be a really weird trade off in a couple of generations to where <clears throat> before there was nothing to of uh, you know photos and videos and audio and that stuff. Now we have the capacity to take photos and videos of every single thing, and in a couple generations, there's going to be so much of that that hmm. no person in their right mind would want to go back and try to get through the content created by multiple generations of their family. Yeah, even if it, it'd be awesome to have it, great, you can put it on like your 50 million terabyte drive and like have it, but you're not going to go through it. That doesn't yeah. make any sense because we shoot video and pictures of everything, mm -hmm. right? And that's not going to get better. <laughs> so I get it's just weird. It's like the same problem of furniture, but it's digital. Like, do you you want to have to download Great Granddad's terabyte drives? I don't want to. I don't have time for that. You know, like it's it's like a weird. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the same thing in a couple generations. I don't know. I'm not well, trying to be negative or defeatist at all. It's just interesting to think about how stuff is stuff, physical or digital. Mm -hmm. It's still stuff. And at some point down the line from us, people aren't going to care about our stuff. Or they're not going to know why they should care about it. I think that I think that's it. It, it. it could either be so abundant that you can't weed through to the important points. Yeah. Where everything just kind of becomes lost in a, in a fog, um, or it's just not relevant. Because I mean, my mom has pictures. I just don't know who those pictures are. So I think it, it's right. an association. There has to be a story. There has to be some importance because the pictures in the video that we take here will have no context, or people won't know why it's important, or they don't yeah. know who you are. But I have I have one old flip phone that I have kept, like. Ever, ever since I had it and I have the charger for it and I made sure to keep the charger because it has a video of my mom uh, laughing hmm and I can't get it I've tried well I, I tried back when but I was told that I could not get that video off of that flip phone onto anything else really yeah so I still have the phone and I still have a charger huh so it is like the one video other than like the VHS ones I have when I was a kid or whatever like the last time my mom like laughed with me hmm. and so that's the thing that like i have and i'm keeping and yeah. i keep it in like my, my little i don't know if you have a little like box or nook of like totems little safe yeah. things yeah. which i don't expect my kids to care being heirlooms but those are things that are just they're important to me yeah and i can take down all my defenses and they're inside this little box but i don't know my kids don't know why it's important it's yeah. just another phone to them. And if I died right now, that thing would go into the technology waste, like the hundreds of thumb drives I have randomly around that have you know, term papers or whatever on them. And so I, I don't want to put that on them. But at the same time, if certain things were gone from my life, like it would impact me more than the things that I got rid of. Like when I got rid of my workshop, I get hurt. Hmm. I had to go take like things that I made and people didn't want to buy, but I had to leave. So I threw them in the woods and like that act, I didn't think, I thought I was stoic enough to not care, but it, it stung. Yeah. But I mean, that was like a piece of wood and a whatever. I mean, but like there are things that are important to me and I think with enough like context clues or deductive reasoning or like my dad has this box and it's full of random things. These random things must be important to him. But again, they would keep it blindly. Just they may associate it to because it's important yeah. to me, potentially. They don't know why. Yeah. And it would be hard for me or they're not of the right age or of the right mindset for me to share those things, to bring them into that secret totem world as to why they're important. But I, I don't think it would be of that same level. Hmm. So those are just, just me. Yours. Heirloom. Yeah. So like heirloom and a quick connotation that it would pass from generation to generation. Maybe. Yeah, I don't have those things, so I don't I don't have the practice deep seated enough to want to pass fourth Excalibur to the to the kids. But there are those super close knit like 
this is a manifestation of a moment that is like and in that movie inside out that pixar movie like this is one of my islands or whatever like physical manifestation form but that's just mine yeah it could become trash to the people because if i'm gone then the memory's gone right the association's gone so well and that's what i think i think heirlooms are made are decided upon by the receiver right so like in, in, in the relationship of me and my granddad, or me and my grandma, something only becomes an heirloom because I say it's an heirloom, not because they wanted it to be an heirloom. And that's what we've talked about before. You know, yeah. it's like something could be important to them. That doesn't mean it's going to be important to me, so I'm not necessarily going to carry it on or take it or whatever. It's just clutter. But it, yeah. But at the same time, if I decided that a piece... there, Okay, here's a good example. There's a piece of paper my granddad's drew all the time. Mm-hmm painted all this stuff there's a piece of paper about this big that is next to our toilet in our bathroom and he drew a little sketch sometime when he was sitting on the toilet drew a little That's sketch so of a beach cool. with a guy and he left it there and i don't know if that was a year before he died if it was the day before he died i don't know hmm. but it was left right there and i just leave it there because it's just a little piece of him that I get to see every time I sit down in his bathroom. You know, and it's like, if it disappeared, if it gets thrown away, it's not the end of the world. But, like, I turned a scrap of his, mm-hmm. something he didn't decide to be an heirloom. It was a scrap. It was a sketch. It was a napkin. I turned that into a thing that I cared about for some amount of time. I don't know. But those are the things that your kids or the people that love you are going to have. Because it's going to be... The smallest moments that you share with him individually. Yeah. That because you're you're playing zone <clears throat> with your family because there's, you know, four of them, but you are the only one for them. Right. So the smallest moments that you have, maybe quick, maybe fleeting, is gonna mean a lot more because it's individualized. I don't know if I'm communicating that well. A fraction of your attention is all of their attention to them. Yeah. It's not a quarter. Yeah. So the things that you may not see or understand as important or as valuable or as like impactful or shaping can be. Yeah. And so these big things like the table that I hope will last or an arcade machine or an R2D2, like those things they may think is awesome, but it may be a little scrap of whatever yeah. that they are really holding true. Yeah. And if we have unfinished business and we come back as ghosts then we can come and find out, but <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It, it also like, you know, we were talking about the digital stuff. I think there's like looking at the potential for overwhelm in the next generation of how much digital garbage they're going to have to go through. There's almost a little bit of like incentive to like weed out what you leave behind. Same thing goes for physical stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that's a everybody should go through their stuff before you get to the age of thinking about like your actual mortality obviously it could happen anytime but you know as you age you should start to clean out your stuff so that your kids don't have to same goes for digital especially Mm -hmm. if you want them to remember you and be able to actually go through it you know you leave somebody a dump truck of photos they're not going to look at the photos if you leave them a shoebox they're going to go through and look at every single one Mm -hmm. and you know you could you can do that same thing digitally i think but it's i don't know I don't have an answer for any of this stuff. It's just, it's all stuff that floats around in my head. And there's like a whole nother, there's a whole other half of this thing that has nothing to do with physical objects. That's all about, uh, I don't even know how to say it. There's, a, there's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to voice it. There's this other conversation that I've had with myself for a long time about mortality and about how just, <clears throat> Whether, whether certain things matter or not. And I've never been able to voice it. But it's attached to the same thing. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, does this stuff matter? Like, do, do, do physical things at all? Do heirlooms? Do the, do the experiences that you pass on to your kids? Do all that stuff? It matters to a point, and then there's a point where it doesn't matter. You know, multiple generations down the road, like my decisions and how I treat this person... I. It's a deep, it's a deep hole. Butterfly effect stuff, yes, yep. it matters. But like the conversation I have with my son about his behavior and about how he should impact this and how he should listen to that person and not react this way, that affects him. 
Mm-hmm. He will affect his kids. They will affect their kids. I get that path. But like also the minutia of my decisions is gone with me for the most part. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> well, no. It... <laughs> so when we decided to move into the RV and leave my old job and leave our big house, it was that was at the, the heart of that decision-making process. It was like we are focusing on all of these things. Mm-hmm. We have to fill rooms with stuff like what activity do we need to go do? What do they need to be involved in? And it, we we were creating spaces filled with things that they could be alone, like and by themselves. Like you could go in your room and you have everything you could possibly want in your room. Or yeah. you can go play baseball. Or you can go play whatever. Like when we went out and the experiences that we all got to share together, uh, I... I know our kids are still really young, but I know that Deacon will, will pipe up every once in a while about things that we did on our trip. Um, those are the things that I think will stand up more than anything. Oh, yeah. Like, those moments they got to share. Good good ones, bad ones, you have to take them all, in, in, all together. Um, and so with our, our trip, there was a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety and a lot of that stuff for me. But like I could, the moments when I was able to stop and just like look at them, enjoying each other, learning with each other, growing together with each other, like that was what I was hoping was going to happen. Yeah. And it's impossible to tell whether that would have happened in the house and or not. I don't know. But like those are those like nostalgic dad moments when I could just sit back and they don't pay attention to me being here. They're just the three of them being okay all together yeah and sharing this moment and just like hoping okay maybe not the table maybe not the whatever but like i hope you remember this moment Hmm. and they probably won't right because beyblades is coming on in a little while (laughs) which takes priority (laughs) but out of i would say in in my my little box like there's also those photos that represent to me like that moment like yeah please hold on to this and they may not because they don't care. Or I was looking from a different perspective and like it was right before they stubbed their toe or they may associate it completely differently. They hated being there, you know, whatever. But those are those moments where I feel like the trajectory forward for them could have been affected or I hope they're affected. And so that moment or that experience or that lesson was way more important than a physical tangible thing. Yeah, because that that physical thing is them regressing back and looking back on me rather than them taking that principle or that experience or that shaping moment and make shaping them forward. Yeah. And hopefully it will shape the next people in the next bit. And I think that's really what an heirloom is intended to do. Is that you're taking the past and affecting the future with it. Right. And I just think it's so much easier to do that with like a, a lesson or a seed, the mental seed than it is with Excalibur because Excalibur could be lost on someone on hard times and end up at the pawn shop yeah, yeah. or be put in a museum and it just has, you know, dedicated from whoever underneath. <clears throat> but we have our old, the Mac that was in here. Um, we bought that Mac in 2009 and it has the photo booth. Do you guys ever play with photo? Oh, yeah. 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 And I take those when I remember. So it's probably every six months or eight months or whatever. But like the very first picture is Tiffany and I. Like just the two of us when we first bought it. And then the next couple of pictures is her pregnant with Deacon. Then like there's Deacon when he's a baby. And so hmm. it is it is that brief synopsis like just in front of this computer. Yeah. Where it has all like the face distorting stuff. So it's always really silly and really fun pictures. So the world that that photo booth gets to take or the story that that photo booth is telling is really fun. Yeah, right. Because it's it's shaped in that context. Yeah. And so on all the terabytes of data that someone has about your life that they're probably not going to weed through, like if they had to weed through something, I would hope it would be that photo booth strip. Hmm. Because it's, here's our last day in Belgium. This is the last picture I took at the hotel before we got on, a, on the plane with this computer. And... Here's me holding up Isaac for the first time because now he's introduced to the photo booth, like the super condensed version yeah. of my generation. Huh. And it's really fun. And they want to take like a thousand pictures. And I keep t- like, nah, th- th- that's good. 
Like, just a couple. Yeah. So I, that it I, doesn't clutter I up. I don't yeah. want you to pervert huh. this. I, I want to keep it what it is, probably against your will and against your wishes because <laughs> yeah. it's just the silliness for them right now. Yeah. But like in my mind, I have that association or like that goal. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And it's, I mean, that computer survived. It works just as great now as it did the day I bought it. So it kind of helps that the technology is keeping up. Yeah. But uh, I stopped and looked back through all those. Man, this is a really deep episode, man. I'm about, yeah. to, <laughs> I'm about to get misty here in a second. But That is really cool to have a kind of single channel to capture like the, like you were saying, like a six-month basis. Mm -hmm. Rather than that our phones are hourly. Right. Right. Yep. It's just like it's so much because in the moment, this seems like the thing that we need to capture. And the five minutes from now, that thing seems like the thing we need to capture. That's kind of cool to to do a six month or yearly thing. Mm -hmm. I, as much as I dislike a lot of things about Facebook, one of the things I do like about it is how they bring back old photos. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because I don't upload that many photos to Facebook. Mm -hmm. So that the ones that are brought back are ones that I intentionally said, this makes me smile so much that I want to see it again in a year. And I've, I've, over the last couple of years, have actively uploaded fa Facebook photos so that I will see them again in a few years. So hmm. that the only things that they can send me reminders are, are not of a car crash, not of the time that I dropped my phone in the toilet, and any of that, which I never have. But, you know, it's not that type of stuff. It's like, man, this day was awesome. I got to put that picture up so that in five years, when my teenagers are driving me crazy, I see that picture again, you know, if Facebook's still around or whatever. So it's kind of the same kind of thing. So maybe um, we need to make like a time capsule, like a slow leak time capsule. Slow leak time capsule. Okay. So that we can fill it with those kind of moments. And then when we die, like... Oh, they leak out over it time. It just gives little pieces of huh. those things that we kept sacred and that we want other people <clears throat> to know. And it's got context to it, maybe. So that they can just little by little... Over the, over the years, huh? That's a cool idea. Yeah, that sounds like an app waiting to happen, right? Yeah, because when I found my mom wrote me a letter, she wrote me two letters, I think. I know I don't know where the other one was. I have one. Um, but I like all the things that she's ever written. I mean, she's written tons of stuff. Like, I go back to that because yeah. that seemed important. But she typed it, so I don't like it because she typed it. Like it, it seems a layer removed because it's typed and it's not handwritten. Yeah. So that's, I, there's a part of me that like, if I have an idea, if I have a sketch, if I have a, whatever, a concept, I like to still draw things out because if something happened to me now and the kids wanted to hold on to something like they, they can see that pen, like your, your granddad, like if your granddad had an iPad near the toilet and then we're <laughs> doodling with the Apple pen, like, I don't know if that association would be yeah. the same. Yeah. Um, but I remember my mom had terrible handwriting. And it was one thing that I laughed about. And it was one of those things I mm. just always kept near me. And so that, the letter that she wrote me, it doesn't have that. And so that's a piece that is a, it's a layer that is not there that I would hope it would be there. Yeah. So if I were going to put things in that time capsule, it would it would be a lot of photos. But it would be more photos of things that I actually drew or actually did with my own hand. Yeah. Maybe. It'd be cool to do that, but also, like, even if you had photos, to do, like, some sort of voice track with it, explaining, like, you were talking about watching the kids interact in a certain way, and they may be totally oblivious of the fact that you were watching. It would be awesome to go back and, like, do commentary hmm. on why you took pictures of certain things about your kids or, or certain moments or, like, you know, any of the stuff that we hold on to because we yep. think it's important relative to our kids to explain why it's relevant. Because, like you said, they're going to go through your box, and they're not going to know why any of that stuff matters. But if they had a video of you saying, like, this matters because it was my thing from that thing in this time mm -hmm. and whatever, they would actually mean something to them. Maybe. Maybe I, not. But. I think besides, like, heartstrings, practically, like, that's really important. Because there were things that I needed to know, like, about my childhood or about, like, when Tiffany was, was pregnant. My mom was a nurse. And so there was stuff I'm like, did this happen to me as a kid? Like, mm -hmm. was this a thing? Because I'm not able to remember. And yeah. she wasn't around to tell me about that story or tell me about you know, certain times or whatever. So those could be really important just pragmatically. Right. And it reminds me, there was like a Michael Keaton movie a long time ago where he was going to die or something. He was making videos for his son. 
You ever really? see that? Yeah. No, he was so. teaching him how to shave, and he was like, always up and down, never sideways. I was, <laughs> I always remember that moment. I don't shave anymore, but that moment from that Michael Keaton movie I stuck with me. He was trying to like teach his future son or future kids things because he wasn't going to be around. Huh. I don't remember what movie that was. I don't know. I don't know. I gotta find one. it, but it seems appropriate. Yeah. But yeah, like a slow leak time capsule with context. I think okay. it's very good. We we combine it R two D two. Ooh, that projects boom. projects a memory every six months. That is perfect. Randomly wakes them up in the middle of the night. Like, we got another <laughs> message. <laughs> wow, that's good. We could just like hint that there's treasure in the first one just to keep people interested. Just, yeah. That's a good idea. Because <laughs> you just have like a super boring <laughs> life. It's like, oh, here's a picture of the time I went to the grocery store. Yeah. That one episode of Full House was super funny. <laughs> yeah, it was good. That's it. Anyway, we got deep. Yeah, we hour did. 15. Dang. Dang. That's, All right. that's hour and 15 minutes? Yes. Hour, hour, hour D15? No, I said hour <laughs> hour and 15. Hour and D. Hour and 16. Yes. All right. Well, let's wrap it up because we're going long. Um, where can people find you? On Instagram, wherever I post pictures of random things. That, <laughs> now I'm not going to from what we've talked about now. But uh, Instagram at the PI Workshop. Cool. And we're both at... I like to make stuff on all the stuff. And, um, yeah, I'd love to know what you think about this topic. If you're listening, you have some feedback, yeah, let us know somehow, somewhere. All right, that's it for this one. Yeah? Yeah, man. Cool. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.